How are you doing this morning? Okay, I think I'm in a center right here. So I'm giving you a clue. If you are too much to the right, we're in trouble. If you are too much to the left, we are in trouble. It has more than one meaning, my statement that I just made. But uh, you might disagree with me and that's fine. I love you. I am so very excited for our time together, the next 30 minutes um, of hanging out together, having conversation that is, I hope, based on the scripture. Uh, I might share a few thoughts and express um, some of my principles that I believe are based on the scripture and they might be pretty vivid and uh, straight to the point. Uh, I'm not here trying to offend anybody, but if what I'm going to say is offending you, just remember I love you, okay? And uh, if you want to have a conversation about anything that I'm going to talk about, let's get a scripture, let's get it going, amen? Uh, it's going to be tough for me to follow an, an amazing message uh, by Dr. Blaine Charette last Sunday, phenomenal message, uh, discipleship, what it means to be a disciple simply in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and Dr. Blaine did a terrific job explaining and showing how important it is, the very first rule, the principle, the law to live by, a principle I would prefer is listen, just listening to God, what it means to listen to God, just so awesome. And I'm going to continue, and we're starting today within discipleship, and discipleship, remember, outside of understanding the kingdom of God will fail us. Discipleship will be mere rules. It will be just sheer commandments and another set of uh, regulations outside of understanding the kingdom of God. We will become as religious as it gets. And so we are on this journey understanding what discipleship is all about, but within the context of the kingdom of God. And um, this next small series is, I call it series because it's going to be four messages or so, just based on three verses in Romans Okay, let me ask you this. Outside of, for God so loved the world, what's the second most popular Christian passage in the Bible? Anybody knows? Just take a guy, take a guess. I already gave you a clue, it's Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The renewal of a mind. I mean, I don't know, if you grew up in church, you heard this all of your life. And here I am to bother you even more. If you are new to church and Christianity, well, we're going to have fun. So without further ado, let's go to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to read these um, three verses. And we're going to focus particularly on verse 2, the first part of the verse. And today is the first part of this Romans 1 through uh, 12, 1 through 3, four-part series about discipleship. And we will all name them in just one or two words, so it will be easy to remember. But we're going to have a good time. Therefore, everybody say therefore, and this therefore is very important. Therefore is, as we were discussing with, with Blaine earlier today, just this is literally a transitional moment in a whole book of Romans. Can I just, just for a second, let me give you a quick one minute background. Paul, the apostle, the author of what many will consider to be half of the New Testament, there are 27 books. Some consider Paul is an author of, of Hebrews, some don't consider it. And if you take Hebrews away, it's still 13 out of 27 author, penned by Paul. And then if you add Hebrews, it's 14, so now it's majority as far as the number of books. So this guy wrote half of New Testament, okay? But now he's writing to the church in the capital of the world. I believe personally that Rome is more similar to Seattle, perhaps, than any other cities in the United States of America. I believe that Rome is more similar to Seattle than any other cities in the United States of America. As far as the life that was happening in the time of Jesus, particular time of Paul, in the city of Rome, the biggest the most sophisticated, uh, economically prosperous city, the most diverse city in the world 
at that time, by far the most diverse cities. And there were people coming from all over, particularly people from Judea. They came to Rome simply looking to uh, survive physically. There was famine in Judea, famine in Galilee, famine in Syria, all over. And people that could, they got their gatherings, got it together, and, and just ran to the city, the capital, and say, we always will find a job, and we just want to survive. So they go to Rome at that time where Caesar is and the government that rules the world, basically. And they are planting a church. A lot of new people are giving their life to Jesus, people that have no roots in Judaism. So now of the two, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and the Jews are building a church together. And Paul, the apostle, hears about it, and he is writing to this thriving church, writing a letter, a church he has never visited before. Think about it. At some point, he'll be in Rome for the judgment by the Caesar because he became famous enough. And as a Roman citizen, he was entitled for the judgment by the Caesar, the courtroom where Caesar will make decision about his destiny at that point. And so he's writing in a letter, and if you're ever studying Romans, uh, I know we started a class earlier this year, and we'll continue at some point. It's one of the most encompassing, you know, um, complete book as far as understanding what God is all about, what Christianity is all about, what the gospel is all about, what life in the kingdom of God is all about. The, 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 the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, all of it. Book of Romans is incredible. A lot of people were afraid of the book of Romans because it has a language that is so legal and, and ideas that seem complicated and language that is such a straightforward language. People, but not us, not the image church because we are in Seattle in the end of the day, so it's a, it is about us. So let's have fun, amen? All right, so I'm, I'm not gonna go into details. I'm really worried that I will kind of um, leave my main point and just kind of start explaining things and I don't want to do that. So, um, therefore, first 11 chapter, Paul laid the foundation, laid the ground. He, if I may use the term, he poured concrete. The trenches were, were digged. I mean, they, 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 there was enough trenches for Paul to build the whole system and he poured the foundation on it. And the first 11 chapters are absolutely foundational to understand what Paul is saying. A lot of demands, commandments, if you may say, in Christian world, starting chapter 12. I mean, they are full of it, particularly chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. And without understanding first 11 chapter, you wouldn't understand what we're talking about today. Here we go. Therefore, because of the foundation, Paul says that I just laid first 11 chapter, I urge you, brothers and sisters, notice he's talking to church. Just say he's talking to me. Just say it. He's talking to me. Paul is talking to me right now, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. I urge you, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, the biggest oxymoron in the Bible, right here. Living sacrifice. Sacrifice should be dead. But you have to be dead yet living. Think about it. Anything you sacrifice is capiche, done, gone, breathless. Here it is. Living sacrifice. If you ever want to understand what God has called you to, he called you to be Less of you as your old lifestyle and all about Jesus. Living sacrifice. Present yourself, offer your body as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. So many of us ride on a talent and we think this is worship. Just because you can hit the key in your car, at least that's what you think, okay? And you don't need James Corden to drive and you, you know, with you in a car to see how you, well you can sing and, and kind of mimic somebody else's singing. You think you can hit the key. Do you think that's worship? That's not worship. Worship is presenting yourself. Say, God, 
I worship you. You are worth, and, and, and that word has got me in the last few months, worship. From German word, worth. What does that worth, worship come from? Worthy, worth. What, that, what is God worth to you? This is your true worship, Paul says. And here we go. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in according with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This I read in context. I'm going to go back to verse 2. Verse 2, and we're going to stay there. One more time. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. The title of my message today is very simple. I call it with one word. Unlike. Everybody say unlike. Just say it, unlike. Father, I thank you that you have given us this opportunity to reason together. And more than that, to allow your spirit to change the way we think. To allow your spirit To put us through x-ray, a uh, very heart, through x-ray, according to your truth. To allow your spirit to lead us and guide us. Lord, I pray with every one of my brothers and sisters. This isn't me versus them. This isn't even you versus us. This is about us. Together, we are your people. Father, speak to us by your spirit. This is my prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Two weeks ago, I asked a simple question before I preached a short message. Some of you believe it's never short, but that's fine. I think you're right. I asked the question, what is your purpose in your life? What is your purpose for living? We talked about kingdom, understanding kingdom. And today I'm going to ask you, what, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does that mean to be a Christian? What does it mean? And please do yourself a favor. Whatever, whatever urges you have to leave, restroom, breaks, stay. Stay with me, I beg you. As Paul says, I urge you, stay with me, Okay? Stay with me. Watch how God will speak to you. What does that mean to be a Christian? We know that the word Christian basically comes from the idea of to be like Jesus. Christian. I hope we know that. Follower of Christ. But what is Christian in reality? If, you, if I ask you to explain to me what is Christian, I want you all to look at me for a moment. What is Christian? If I ask you publicly right now, I wouldn't do it to you. I wouldn't try to embarrass you or maybe magnify you, make more of you if I call you and you did answer that question pretty biblically, accurately. But what would you say? How would you explain to me in one sentence? What does it mean to be Christian? Oh, to be like Jesus. Okay, what, what does that mean? Before we answer the question, let's talk about where we're at as far as July 2023 in the Pacific Northwest, in the United States of America, <laughs> post-modern world, post-Christianity. What does that mean? If you were born in this area, what are some of the first things that you are facing as far as a young child? If you're in school, what's happening? Let's, let's, let's have fun a little bit. 
And again, stay with me. Don't take anything out of context what we're going to talk about. Can you look at me, please? Some of the questions that you will be facing with in schools are literally, and this isn't throwing rocks against anyone, uh, what, what, what do you identify with? Isn't it true? We ask our kids, is it, are you a boy or a girl? Or perhaps neither. This is 21st century, 2023, July, Pacific Northwest. What do you identify as? What happens? I want you to hear me right now. The world we're living in. The world used to tell us, hey, Christians, look at biology. You want to prove us the living God? Look at biology. Biology doesn't add to the creator that you're preaching about. The Bible is too narrow for science. It's too narrow. It's too small. Come on. What are we talking about? So the world used to parade biology. Now it's all upside down. Transition time. Why? Because now they say, no, no, no. It doesn't matter what biology tells you. You're a boy or a girl, or perhaps neither. It's ideology. We have an idea what you might be. So ideology is way about biology now. Isn't it true? That's the truth. Nobody wants to argue with me biology. It used to be I grew up as a little kid in, in Soviet Ukraine where every single month I would be on a train from Carpathian Mountains to the capital, Kiev, for 18 hours. And I kid you not, every time for seven years, there's always atheists that want to talk to me about Christianity. They always argue with me. And everybody was all about biology, always, which I loved. I wasn't a biology major, but I loved it. I always say my favorite, I was like, I'll take an eye, for example. Have you studied an eye? I always ask. Have you studied the complexity of an eye? Have you? So I would have a couple of five, seven statements about the complexity of an eye. And I said, how can out of nothing eruption this incredible organ, a member of my body, how can this organ come to what I have right now? Think about it. Doctors are blown away as they are studying more. Just the eye. I'm not talking anything else. We used, to, we used to argue biology. Now, nobody wants to talk to me biology. Because I said, sure, I'll give it to you, biology. <laughs> what about sexual activity among young people? This is crazy. Let's be honest. I know we're in the Pacific Northwest. Let me under, um, underline it one more time. But we would do anything to help our young people to stay sexually active. You need to get to know yourself because how can you have your partner help you in the future if you don't know what you like? Go and discover yourself. And the earlier the better. So what do, you, what do you want us to provide for you? Do you want us to provide you with, what is it? Condoms? Great, we'll do it. Vending machine? Absolutely, as much as you want. What else? The pill? The morning after? Absolutely. Just go for it. And then obviously, every other drug that is available... And we say, oh, no, 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 not for kids. Come on. You saturate society with drugs and alcohol, and you're telling me kids won't touch it? Be my guest. Zero chance. We parade it everywhere. We make money on it. Everything. Let's pacify everybody. Let's pacify. Let's, let's, let's a kumbaya moment. Work hard and just get high. And then tomorrow morning, we want you back. And your body is turned into a robot because last night you were really high or drunk. But this morning you show up, let's go to work. We need your productivity because you can't survive any other way. If you don't produce, you don't make money, you can't pay for lease, rent, mortgages. 
That's the society around us, isn't it true? Let's, I'm not taking political side, but let's continue further. Gender inequality? Hmm. I used to be a big gender inequality guy. I'm going to confess right now. You know why? Because I saw my mom, there's 12 of us in the family. So just as a little boy observing mom who was so bright, she has never, this is not mom saying, teachers, I went to the same school, two schools that mom went to. They told me that in the history of school, and there were some teachers that were there 45 years plus, history school, they never had anybody as bright. My mom has never had A minus in nine years of her school years. Not a single one, not a single, A minus, not a single time. She finished school with what we call gold medal. A bright woman. I mean, mom, if my mom looks at your credit card at the age of 65 for literally 30 seconds, in two months ask her everything to the T's. I mean, and so I was like, mom, you could be making money. I was always about gender and equality, let's go. But now... Look at me, everybody. Now? Now it's full in a family. Now we're competing, husband against wife. We used to be partners. No, 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 not anymore. How much money you make? Because I can make more than you. And if I make more than you, I'm in charge. So it's one thing that it's out there. No, 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 no. Now it's part of church. Now we're advising people, just make more money. Prove it to him. Where is partnership? We talked about two weeks ago. Where is it? It's gone. It's gone, and God forbid you stay home with kids. I know they're little, but if you stay home and he makes money, I mean, you don't like him, sue him. Half of it is gone. And for everything that you have to endure. I mean, I, I'm a big believer. I'm not a believer in 50-50. I'm a believer in 100-100. Husband 100% in, wife 100% in. That's it. It's not even 50-50. Where did that come from? So we're both in. But those things creep into church. And now we're saying the same thing. How about we were talking with um, staff members this last week. How about what, what is success around? What does success mean in, in, around us? Look, ask people around us, what, our society. What is success? The first thing people will talk about? Economy. You want to know what success is? Okay. Here's how much money I have. Saved, invested. This is it. So we're molded from, from and shaped from early age into this idea. Okay. Here's money. Here's money. This is what you do with money. I, I, I have to tell you. Maybe it's a cultural thing because, I mean, I've been living in U.S. now almost as long as I've lived outside of U.S. in different countries. But I'll say this, I've never seen anything my early age where young people would not share, would not pay for each other. People come to, to each other's houses and hang out, but everybody bring their own small food from their homes. Nobody offers anything to anybody. I don't know if it's a, people are afraid of lawsuits or, or whatever, but it's like, it's mine and... You know, if you're starving, you're starving. But, you know, because we're, we're, we're projecting that, hey, this is mine. We hang out. We kind of share space. We share the same space, okay? Same body of oxygen. But we're not really friends. Unless, of course, we're drinking together. That can be different. But other than that, no way we're sharing food. Why? Because we're, we're projecting. We need to save. We need to invest. We become so greedy. And what is success? Oh, success is how early can I retire? How early can I retire and then I could travel? Because I couldn't travel. I worked so hard all my life. I slaved, by the way, Pastor John, I slaved. So I can travel. Like, is the whole goal of life is travel. And since I've been just, not much of it because I worked so hard. Now when I'm 65, 67, Get me my RV or maybe, uh, you know, no RV. Now I can fly or whatever that is and let's go. Where are we starting? Central America, South America, Europe, Asia. Where are we starting? As if this is what success is. Save, invest so you can. 
Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And we're sitting here. I'm, I can only imagine how many of us today are listening to me and thinking, this guy had a rough morning today. Like, what in the world is he talking about? Why is he even angry about it? I'm not angry. I'm just talking. This is, this is I, I meet people. We are, my wife and I are weird type of pastors that we meet with so many people around, you know, during the week. This is our life. We hang out with people and we listen and we watch. I want to be sure, I want to observe. And I'm like, wow, Jesus, this is unbelievable. And so Paul says, therefore, I urge you. Therefore, I urge you. <laughs> Before I go that I need to, I, I forgot one moment. I, and I have to write this down because usually I don't talk about these things. But today I am. Okay. What about, what about our social views and political views? Like how vocal are we about it? How many of you are, you're going on a rant, explaining yourself and make yourself clear. And you want me to be like you socially and definitely politically. But you're keeping your faith very private. Your politics are public. Your social views are very public. At least you're going to like somebody's comments. At least. You can always write a blog as well if you have time. And yes, oh my goodness, your vocabulary is huge when you're explaining yourself. But if somebody asks you about your faith... It's a private matter, Pastor John. It's hidden right there. I left it at home. No, not even at home. I left it in church on Sunday morning if I show up once a month. That is where my spirituality is. And getting me on spirituality. Like what is happening in our society that's creeping into churches? People are talking about, instead of going talking about God, this the men upstairs... Oh, it's, it's not popular anymore being a, a Christian. Why would you call yourself Christian? And why would you even talk about believer? I'm just spiritual. I want to be spiritual. Just don't, don't label me. I'm not a believer. Don't, don't say to people that, that, that there's few believers here. I'm not, you know, I'm just spiritual. Wow. It's great. This is what Christianity comes down to. Shh. I don't want to be different. I want to show up to work. I want every one of my friends and my coworkers to say, wow. Yeah, you fit well. You fit well. You are one of us. Absolutely. Yes, you are just like us. You're just like me. So we will nod until our neck hurts. Yes, I'm like you. Like, yes. Everything you say, yes. Why would I stand out? Why would I stick my neck out? Why? When I want to be just accepted. I just want to fit in. <laughs> See, because we are so confused with our identity, God sent us out and he says, hey, the world needs you. You are the very embodiment of what my gospel is all about, says the Lord. But we show up and we're like, huh? Really? Really, God? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So we go back to our whatever it is, our world, work, social life, neighborhoods, gathering, family as well. Say, oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Uh, yes. Mm. This is a new form now. If you're a lady, particularly. Mm. Wow. And if you're a guy. Mm. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. That's right. I'm with you. This is what it comes down to. <laughs> and here is Paul writing to the church in the capital of the world. And he doesn't care that he's never been there. And he doesn't care what they think about him. And now, again, let me just say, you heard my messages and my views on this, I am by no means ever going to preach about bashing people that don't know Jesus. 
Don't you ever walk around judging people that don't know Jesus. I don't even know, by the way, why Christians got this idea, walk around and slapping everybody. I mean, good Lord have mercy. Every non-Christian, we just go after them. Like, where do you see in the scripture from those, and I don't want to use strong words, strange people that stand by the stadiums. I go watch Sounders game. A lot of people that are playing for the Seattle Sounders, we led them to Jesus. They're friends. They are part of church. I go watch them. I'll go support them. There's people with statements. You're going to hell if you're at the stadium. Like, wow. How is that going to make anybody say, wow, I should turn around. Where is heaven? I'm in. Let's go. That's not going to happen. You have in Las Vegas, you have a lot of people giving cards and say nightclubs are all open for you. And then we have a lot of Christians there. Hey, you're going to hell. I'm just like, wow, what a contrast. How is that going to work? There's nowhere in the scripture, okay, that, that, that God has called anybody to walk around and literally send everybody to hell. Like, hell, hell. Even John the Baptist didn't get it because of Old Testament. And I understand what I'm saying right now when I take responsibility for you. That's why Jesus says the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Because John thought that the axe is by the root. Here comes Jesus. Boom! Cuts it all off. The tree falls and here comes Jesus. And he says, I'm going to redeem this tree. And John says from the jail, he's like, are you the one, the Messiah? Because... No, that's not what I believed for. See what I'm saying? This isn't my topic, but I'm just trying to make sure we all understand this. That is the gospel. There's no one in scripture that you walk around going after different religions, different persuasions, people that have not experienced Christ. But the Bible is full of statements what church is like, what you and I should be like. So I'm not here today after anyone who has not experienced Christ. I'm praying that they would experience Christ. Why would I judge them? Their future is not with God. Why would I go after them? Why would I pile on a misery upon them? My job is to pray. My job is to evangelize. My job is to preach. My job is to love. We're talking to church now. We're talking to brothers and sisters. Can we just get Romans 12 again, Vlad? Because just in case we, we kind of miss something. And I think because we don't study scripture, we kind of miss this very clean, very straightforward line. Uh, verse 1, please. Verse 1. Just, just, just for fun. Let's just do this. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you. Say it again. I urge you, Seattle. Nope. I urge you, the people of the United States. Nope. Nope. I'm glad you remember Jonathan Edwards and everybody else, the Great Awakening, the revivals. It's great. Those are evangelists. We're talking about in church scripture, brothers and sisters. Do not be conform. Do not be conform. Unlike. Okay. So the question today is very simple. As your brother... In Christ, and you are my brother or my sister, how can I be unlike the world? How can I be unlike? How can I be what God has called me to be in relation to the world? How can I be? How can I be? Oh, here's how. This, these are the rules. Nope. The moment you pull out the book of rules for me, I'd even doubt she. I'm out. I'm out. I'm done. Why? Because this isn't about rules. It isn't about rules and regulations. I'm going to say this every Sunday. Write this down. Number one, very, very important, very simple, very simple, very profound. It is because, number one, let's go, Vlad. Because, say it loud. God's mercy. It is because of God's mercy. <laughs> Can I just start right here just for a second? I ask in the beginning, what is Christian? Here's what Christian means. Here's what it means. Christian is someone who enjoys relationship with God now because of Jesus' death, 
resurrection and sending of the Holy Spirit into my life. Let me say it one more time, and I'm taking the whole theology together. Someone who's enjoying relationship with God the Father now because Jesus died for me, he rose again to prove that he's the Messiah, and this is what my destiny is, okay? I will rise from the dead one day, amen? And he sent Holy Spirit into my life so I can enjoy this relationship. This is what Christianity is. But the first part is God's mercy. If you think, and by the way, people in the world, if you go to the streets of Seattle right now or to any other city, you can go to Kirkland, Bellevue, Tacoma, whatever, and ask people, what is Christianity? And if people don't know a simple basic principles of Christianity, they will say, Christianity, listen to this, because my 10-year-old daughter last night, she says, Dad, I have a surprise for you. I said, what is it, baby? She says, Isabella says, I just Google what's the most popular religion in America, and it says Christianity. And I was like, wow, Isabella, wow. She's trying to, but she sees I'm reading, you know, commentaries and studying a little bit. And, and, and uh, usually I study, if Vita didn't give me the full message, she usually write all my messages, my wife. I just kind of memorize them. But if she doesn't, then I just have to do my work a little bit as well, like today. That's why I'm a little bit off. And, and so, that was a joke, by the way. She doesn't give me the full message, just 99%. But... Another terrible joke. So then she says, but I have even bigger surprise. She comes back and I said, what is it? She's like, I Google what's the most popular religion in the world. And it still says Christianity. Yay. I was like, wow. I said, Isabella, I love you. Should we drink tea? She says, mama says it's too late. I said, let's just drink tea. She said, well, you don't want to talk about this? I said, no. Why? Because if you go and ask people, we're, we're a Christian nation, by the way. That's what we are. What is Christianity? This is what people will say. Christianity is do a lot of good things. And then when you die and you are up again and God says, hmm, let me see. Pros and cons, let me see. Woohoo, look. Pros, clearly. It's 51 to 49. Peter, open the gates. Peter, let's go. Play, call play, play the song. You know, La Vida, this is it. St. Peter, yep, open the door. Let's go in. 51, just over. This is what Christianity is for a lot of people. But we know that's not what Christianity is. And as long as you believe that lie of the devil, you are a miserable human being. Because you don't enjoy the real Christ and you're imitating Old Testament. Good deeds? Really? This is what Christianity is. God loved me so much while I was so lost, so confused, and on top of it, so arrogant and so self-righteous and all-knowing and the smartest. <laughs> and I knew it all, by the way. And while I was so confused, God loved me so much that Jesus Christ said, John, John, I love you and I'm going to die for you. While you worship idols, Romans 1, your brain was confused, Romans 2, while you were a Jew and full commandments, fulfill the law, you're judging those they were confused, non-Jews, you're also a sinner. Both sinners. So Jesus showed up and says, John, whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew, you're confused. You're a sinner. But I am going to give my life for you. You were born in sin. You lived according to sin. I had to go and redeem you, purchase you with my own blood. You were alienated with God, away from him. And I had to go and adopt you and bring you into the family. You were under God's wrath, anger. And I had to show up with my blood and say, you can judge me, God. So John will be justified. So now he is righteous. So now he is holy, set aside. 
I'm going to redeem him, adopt him, <laughs> regenerate, give him new life. I'm going to train him, renewal of a mind, and the whole process called salvation. And none of it I deserved, none of it. That's why, because Paul says, in view of God's mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, do not try to be different. Do not try to be unlike those around you. Unless you understand how good God is to you. And unless what Jesus has done, what Jesus has done for you. And before you ever know Jesus, please Get to know what he has done for you. Because you get to know someone by what they've done for you. And when you get to know what Jesus has done for you, you said, wow, this is you, Jesus? This is what you've done for me? Wow, I clearly see that you have a heart for me. So until Jesus becomes more valuable than what you see around you until what Jesus has done for you outweighs what feels good your old lifestyle some translations call it your passions until you understand how terrible sin is, what it does to you, contouring you, deforming you, hurting you. That's what sin does. It's not just missing the mark. Oh, okay, participation. I still tried. I'll get a trophy in heaven. I tried to be Christian, Pastor John. I mean, I just didn't, wasn't as good as somebody else. But yeah, I tried. So God will still give me participation. No, either you made it or you didn't. Well, I, I can't make it. Of course you can. That's why Jesus, you can't make it. So we're all in the same boat. I am, I am no better than any one of us. I am no better than anybody outside of the walls of this building, this gathering. Nobody, I mean, no one. Therefore, I shouldn't judge people because I am no better than them. But hey now. Hey now, Jesus showed up in my life and says, I love you. And I said, you're talking to me? You're talking to me? I don't know you. You're talking to me, Jesus? He says, yes, I love you. <laughs> and when I have that experience and I see what he does for me, everything else pales, disappears. All of this Foggy, just gone. In view of God's mercy, Paul says, he wouldn't ask you and I any other way to present your body as a living sacrifice. He wouldn't ask you and I, say, oh, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. No, why? Because I can't. But when you understand God's mercy, when you understand that you were dead in your transgressions, he says elsewhere, you were dead, but Jesus showed up and pff, breathed again into your nostrils, a, a, a life by the Spirit of God. And now you're alive to Him. The Spirit of God came all over you and revealed Jesus to you. And you now have different identity and you don't even need biology to know this. You feel it. You know it. Your Spirit, you know what is right. That's how you become unlike. That's how you become unlike. Not because, oh, I, I, you know, I, I would love to get really high with you and consistently high with you because it is, you know, my pain and I need to really have a kumbaya moment. But, you know, just like I really can't too much. I just get a little bit. What, what are we talking about here? You're different. Let me give you this example, and I'm, I apologize for, just give me a little bit more time. Just give me a little bit of time. You will see it. Imagine baby being born in, in, into your family. 
the baby is being born. I keep telling, I, I, one of my favorite babies, and, and I love everybody, but last two days I've hung out with, with a cow, Mallory. This baby barely cries. I mean, I still want him to pray for Johnny and Mendel and Isabella and Karis because they are still crying. I'm just saying, at the age of 20, I'm, I'm joking, you know. But uh, this baby doesn't cry. Like, I haven't seen him cry in two days. I was like, wow, somebody needs to teach this kid how to cry. I mean, he's a, just an incredible kid. What a blessing, you know. And so he's like, enough. Ryan is crying all the time. My dad, I'm not going to cry. It's enough. One, I'm joking. Ryan is sitting there. I have to make fun of him. Uh, but, what, what, you know, I'm, but I'm telling you, the first thing that kid will learn, I've said it many times. And I've said the other kid, I can't name him in church. You know, the kid is now... Uh, 11 or 12 months, and the first word, they say, oh, he said it. He said, mine. The first word, you want to see what sin is like? Look at this kid. Parents live their life. They worship the kid. And this, rather than say, mama, the kid says, mine. That's what sin does to us. So let's, let's stop there for a moment. Now, the kid is born in your family. It has a different identity. It could be Patrus, it could be Philemon Chuk, it could be, could be Reed, you know. I mean, you name it, pick any family, Sullivan, you name it. But, but, has a different identity, different DNA, was born in this family. It still has to learn. It has to learn the pattern of life. Because if you leave kid all by himself or all herself, it starts with mine, and then everybody else is an enemy. Everybody, including starting with parents. I'm surprised none of our four kids written a book yet. How terrible their upbringing was with this vocal father. I'm not vocal. I'm actually like a sheep in a, in a house. It's just this is the only place I'm allowed to talk. You know, but uh, in a house, it's a... Uh, it's a really gender equality. But anyway, um, I'm joking. Please don't take me seriously right now. Just relax. And if I'm really preaching a bit too harsh, just say, he's an immigrant. I mean, what do you get out of him? I just, uh, other immigrants are amazing, but this one is weird. Anyway, so in view of God's mercy, that's why God is asking you. It's very simple. And secondly, and, and I really want to nail this, because of the birth and adoption we talked about, I just want to quickly... We, 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 I'm just giving you an example. You're adopted. You're different. Why would you go a place, whether in your walk with those around you, or in your thoughts, private life, why would you go place, places that will hurt you? You know it will hurt you. You're adopted into a different family. You are now in a family of God. Jesus Scripture says, purchase the church, all of us, with his own blood. You're adopted. Don't go back to orphanage where there's no one who is your real father, really, that cares for you. You don't need to be lost. You don't need to be confused. You don't need to be on your own. You don't need to try to make something out of this life. What does that even mean? You're in a new family. You have a, a father. In fact... He is giving you a spirit that in you that spirit says to not even God, heavenly father. He says, Abba, Father. Like, you have a different address. You should have a different vocabulary. You have a different perception. You have a different mindset, a different attitude, a different decisions, action, all of that. And only because you understand how merciful God is to you. And only because you understand that you were born again by the Spirit of God. And you're adopted to God's family. Only at that point, number three, okay? Let, watch this. Number three and I'm done. Let's go. What are you known for? See, don't be, confirmed, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Thirty seconds. 
That, in English, we have conform, transform, same root. Not so in original. In original, that word, some of you might recognize, has the root word called scheme, or in, in Greek is schema. A lot of Slavic languages that derive from Greek, which New Testament was written on, is schema, which basically means a system, or an outward expression. So let me say it theologically, explain it right now. You were born in God's family. You belong to God, but guess what? Outward, you're so afraid to be of the family, to be, let me use our family as a, to be Petrus. You're so afraid to be Petrus because why would you be Petrus if you're with different group of people? I could just fit in. And now you allow them to mold you and shape you into their own image, their own identity to the degree that now you're lost, just like Israelites. We talked about it last Sunday, coming out of Egypt, like, oh, okay, we forgot who we are and where is God taking us? We're in desert. Oh, I don't know. We're still... Egyptians have shaped them so much, they didn't remember who they were. Listen, originally Egypt was good, but not everything that starts good continues to be good. It turns into curse. Slavery. Watch out. It feels good in the beginning. Didn't end up good. Feels good now. Let's go. Let's go. Wow, it feels good with my friends. I didn't know this is life. This could be like this. Ha. Used to be virgin, but hey, didn't know it feels that good. Sex feels good. Whew. Okay? Let's see if what you're doing now will turn out to be a blessing. Let's see. Well, we can't preach about that because don't you know, Pastor John? Nobody's virgin by the age of 14. That's it. Don't you know? They, they, they hide and they lie to parents. It's middle school where it all starts. Okay. Let's see what's going to happen after because I've been in ministry this is, this is more than 25 years full-time ministry. I talk to couples all the time. What are you doing to yourself? I can understand if you have no experience of Christ, but you do. But you do. You have seen what mercy of God is all about. You know better than this. So, how can you be different? Listen to me, everybody. I'm just going to make this very powerful statement. You might disagree with me. Why is it that Christian people are known outside of these walls? And I'm taking image church as an example. We are known for what we are against, not what we are for. Think about it. Is it that they label us that we're anti-LGBTQ and what's after Q? I, sorry, I haven't practiced yet all of the alphabet. But, uh, you know, we, we, so what we say? We're against all of this. That's it. Because we are stopped being known for what we stand for. So everybody says, oh, they're always naysayers. They're always against this. We're against this, against this, against it. So now Christians are right there in their corner quietly. They're trying to scream. A voice is gone. Sin, sin. That's sin, sin. That's our voice. Toothless Christianity. Whispering, barely whispering. Why? Because no one is attracted to that. The scripture is full of statements. He says, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. I don't know about you. I'm paying you a lot of money for good salt. <laughs> Seriously. You sweat salt out. Please drink it. Okay. We are the light to the world. We're supposed to be attracted the way we, 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 we relate to each other. We love one another. You see your brother and sister outside. This week alone, I stumble upon at least three families from the Image Church in different places. We hang out. We talk life. I'm not like, ah, I'll see you on Sunday on stage. Bye. Yeah. Bye. No. We're brothers. How can I help you? What can I do for you? What can I pray for you for? Is there anything... And when the world sees, as, as, as John says, hey, 
when the world sees that you love one another, he's quoting Jesus, they will say, truly they are, talk to me, they are who? Disciples, exactly, we're talking discipleship now. But what are we known for? Nope, we're against this, against that, against that, that's it, that's it. How can we be effective? So of course, our kids are growing up. Christianity is not attractive. Why would be? Because we are always against something. What are you known for as a follower of Jesus? What if I ask three of your friends in different circles that you were hanging out with, if I ask three of your friends and say, can you describe to me Matt or Todd or Amanda or Steve or Talia? What if I ask you, say, hey, describe to me, what, what do you think of her? And it's going to be anonymous, private. What would they say about you? What are you known for? And because you see that you are not effective, what this book has been calling you to, as far as being effective, the call God placed upon, God has placed a call upon your life, that call, in effect, you're like, oh, you know, th th those memes, I forgot what, I don't watch those shows, but how you go quickly back to the bushes, what's the meme? You know, you're coming, Simpsons, yeah, you know, back is like inside, I, I saw this like, thousands of times, different places, and even on billboards. Hey, I'm not effective, so I'll just go back and hide. And now I'm one of them. Why? Because what I believed for, somehow ineffective. Somehow it doesn't work. It's not powerful. It's not life-changing. How many of your friends have been so impressed with the way God is so real in your life? Because listen to this, Christianity is not a thought. Christianity has to, it's a reality. It has to be proclaimed, it has to be believed, it has to be lived out. It's a reality. This is Christianity. Not some thought, we do this spiritual thing, and you do this spiritual thing, and we're the same. Because we're both spiritual. And the man upstairs can hear us. Or higher power, that's another one. The higher power. I told this pastor the other day, I said, higher power, what was that? He's like, well, you know. Like, who even know what God is these days? Like, whew, let me just go before I say something. That's not, I mean, higher power? A pastor. A higher power. I mean, I don't know what, who's higher now, but something is not right. This is what I'm trying to say, friends. Come on. You have family to raise. <laughs> Let's go further. You have God's call upon your life. God did not fail when he called you to be like him. He didn't fail. It wasn't too much. It wasn't too weird. It wasn't too outlandish. No, it's real. Why? Because it's a reality. The Spirit of God in you encourages you to do things that are so contrary, so different than what you see around, so uniquely different. And you do things, you're like, wow, you, you, why, why would you do this? Ah, I love you, my friend. That's the answer to those non-Christians. Love you, my friend. Practice it. Stand in front of me or say, open your wallet, by the way. Hold your wallet. Say, love you, my friend. Oh, that's one way. Seriously. Because I always say this, and I'm going to say it again. 1 Corinthians 7, greed is on the same name, same vocabulary as homosexuality. So don't judge homosexuals if you're greedy. Paul wasn't even judging them. He just says, Christians, you shouldn't live this way. So yes, how about encouraging, inspiring, embracing, loving? How about step out, step forward, say, I would love to do this for you. That would preach. That would be different. That is unlike. That is unlike. That is unlike. And I encourage you this morning, as angry as I sounded today, I apologize. I'm just so frustrated because I don't want this to creep into our 
community and our families and my own life, I work hard. I say, Lord, let me be known for something else. Let me be known. Let me have the cross of Christ in the middle of my life. I want to encourage you right now. Would you please allow the Spirit of God to speak to you today? As we pray earlier, have Him take you through x-ray. Because you belong to Him. I'm preaching to brothers and sisters. This is a sharing message. Equipping, that's what God has called me to. Ephesians 4, 11, to equip. I want, to, I want you all to, could you just stand to your feet just for a moment? I realize this isn't one moment thing, but I do know for sure this is a renewal of a mind. It's a process. And we have to start here and we have to start now. We have to say, God, here I am. Here I am, God. Would you just close your eyes where you're at right now? 